Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Julie Oliver and she's a science dog. In this video we're going to be debunking the latest anti-vaxxer nonsense which is centered around a paper about spike protein and DNA from two scientists working in Sweden. We'll be showing that the conclusions of the paper aren't supported by the data they present and that the claims being made by anti-vaxxers aren't even supported by the paper's conclusions. But before we go back to the science, I would like to say that I think spike protein suffers from an image problem based on its name. Spike sounds pretty scary, right? If they had called it binding protein or something else benign, I'm sure no one would be as scared. But I digress. Let's have a look at the paper. So the paper is called SARS-CoV-2 Spike Impairs DNA Repair and Inhibits VDJ Recombination in Vitro and it is part of a special issue on SARS-CoV-2 host cell interactions in a journal called Viruses. Interestingly, everyone is referring to the paper as the Swedish paper, which I think is meant to give it more credibility. Not exactly sure why, but hey, Sweden was responsible for ABBA. And I was a huge ABBA fan when I was a kid. Luckily for you guys, copyright laws prevent me from bursting into song right now. Anyway, at the time I recorded this video, the paper had been viewed nearly 200,000 times. And it's safe to say that the majority of people viewing it didn't understand it at all. And that includes two YouTubers who each have over 1 million views on the videos they made about it. And just so you know, the other articles in the issue have one to 2,000 views. Now, there are so many things wrong with this paper that it's hard to know where to start. But I'm going to start with what's the most egregious thing. This figure is part of a larger figure from the paper. And it is a main part of the evidence that forms the premise of the paper, which is that spike protein gets into the nucleus of cells. They use fluorescent markers to identify the spike protein and the cell nucleus. The green you can see in the image at the top is a spike protein. And then in the picture underneath, this has been overlaid with the nucleus, which appears in blue. Now, there is definitely some overlap, so it does appear that the spike protein has got into the nucleus, although it seems to be more around the edges. Now, they also looked at a bunch of other SARS-CoV-2 proteins and they also got into the nucleus. And they mentioned that their results here were consistent with the findings of a previous study that also showed that these proteins went into the nucleus. So I decided to take a look at this study and I was shocked because the other study also investigated whether the spike protein went into the nucleus and they found that it didn't. So these are the images from the other paper and it's pretty clear that the spike protein is completely outside of the nucleus. You can see the blue circle is completely inside the green spike protein. So the authors of the Swedish paper knew that another study had found the exact opposite results to them, but they didn't even mention it. This is what is known as deception by omission. The authors are trying to imply that their study, which was done in embryonic kidney cells, is somehow relevant to completely different cells in the human body when they know for a fact that other scientists have shown that it doesn't happen in another cell line. By the way, another YouTuber who reviewed this study claimed that the cells used had been modified to resemble B and T cells. This is simply not true and I have no idea why he would even think it. The authors of the paper certainly don't claim it. Anyway, I thought I'd have a look to see if any other studies had looked at whether spike protein goes into the nucleus or not. And I found this one. Guess what? It also found that the spike protein doesn't enter the nucleus. And it's worth mentioning that both the papers that found that spike protein didn't enter the nucleus are in much higher quality journals than the Swedish study. So the Swedish study has results that directly conflict with the findings of two previous studies. And the authors haven't even mentioned this. And the so-called expert peer reviewers haven't picked it up either. But that's not the only flaw in the paper. The way they get the spike protein into the cell in the first place is by transfecting it with a plasmid. The plasmid is basically a small circular DNA molecule that goes into the cell nucleus and gets it to make bucket loads of spike protein. Now, this is a reasonably common research technique, but it is not what happens when you are infected with SARS-CoV-2 or when you are vaccinated. And 
then you need to be careful when you are using these techniques that the results you are seeing are just what is known as an artifact which is when you see something that is actually the result of the procedure that you are using and not something that would occur naturally. Now if we go back to this slide comparing the results from the Swedish study with the study that they referenced, you will notice that the reference study has some red stuff as well as blue and green, but the Swedish study doesn't. The red actually represents proteins that are naturally present in the cells and these serve as a control because if a protein does end up in the nucleus you need to make sure it ended up there naturally and not because your experimental technique has made the nucleus more likely to take up proteins. But the Swedish study didn't include this important control so we don't know whether they are just seeing an artifact. And this same issue of not using appropriate controls occurs again and again in this paper. I won't bore you with every one of them, but I will show you one that is particularly relevant to the overall claim of the paper. And that is an assay that purports to show that spike protein hinders DNA repair. The assay is called a comet assay and it is a simple method for measuring breaks in DNA strands. To check how well a cell repairs DNA damage, what you do is you treat your cells with something that causes DNA damage and then remove the damaging agent and use the comet assay to see what happens to the cells over time. And these little red blobs show the results of this assay for the Swedish study. What they did was looked at three different ways of damaging DNA, gamma radiation, doxorubicin, which is a drug used in chemotherapy, and hydrogen peroxide, which some people use to bleach their hair, not me, but it's also a well-known oxidizing agent. They then compared cells that had been transfected with full-length spike protein with cells that had been transfected with shorter bits of spike protein and cells that had been transfected with empty plasmids. So if there is no DNA damage, you get nice round dots like the pictures at the top. But if there is damage, you will get a tail that looks a bit like a comet, hence the name of the assay. Now you can see that whether or not there was any protein put into the nucleus, the DNA was still damaged. And that's not surprising. To quantify the damage, image software is used to measure the length of the tails and the results can be seen in this graph. Now the graph shows that there is more damage to the DNA of the cells transfected with full length spike protein than to the cells transfected with shorter spike protein or empty plasmids. But what we don't know is if this is actually biologically significant because the difference is only about 25%. And one of the reasons we don't know is because they haven't used a positive control. A positive control is a substance that is known to produce the effect that you are looking for. So in this case, it would be something that is known to stop DNA repair. If they'd run a positive control and the result was about 400, for instance, it would mean that this result was meaningless. But if the result was about 100, this result could mean something. But they didn't do it, so we don't know. So that's a positive control. The other thing they haven't done is a proper negative control. They've looked at an empty plasmid, but they haven't looked at naked cells with no plasmid at all. And that's a problem because the plasmid itself could be hindering DNA repair and the spike protein could just be making the problem caused by the plasmid worse. The other key claim being made by the Swedish study is that the spike protein inhibits VDJ recombination. Now, VDJ recombination is a process that occurs in the bone marrow and the thymus, and it is used to generate a huge library of antibodies that are ready and waiting to be deployed if a suitable pathogen turns up in the body. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. The important thing to know, though, is that this process doesn't happen in response to an infection. It is occurring all the time. So even if the spike protein did inhibit it, it would be irrelevant. And of course, there is no evidence whatsoever that spike even enters the bone marrow or the thymus. So this paper is basically drawing a number of conclusions that aren't supported by the data. But anti-vaxxers are taking it to a whole new level by drawing conclusions that aren't even being made by the authors of the paper. According to anti-vaxxers, this paper means that COVID vaccines are going to cause cancer. Now, let's ignore all the flaws in the paper for a minute and assume that spike protein really can inhibit DNA repair. 
that would mean you need to be getting vaccinated ASAP because the amount of spike protein produced by infection with SARS-CoV-2 is several orders of magnitude higher than what is produced by vaccination. And it can spread to all organs of the body, as well as the lungs. SARS-CoV-2 has been found in the heart, the brain, the spinal fluid, the kidneys, the GI tract, and the testes. COVID vaccines are injected into the deltoid muscle and the amount delivered is finite because unlike viruses they don't replicate. The amount that gets into circulation is so small that they had to develop special assays to even detect it. So if you know any of the millions of people who have been sucked in by the misinformation that is circulating based on this paper, please share this video with them. Now you'll find the links to the studies I've referenced in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to see more videos about the science in the future, please hit the subscribe button.